Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Who's ready for some college hoops? Today's guest, University of Houston's men's basketball coach, Calvin Sampson, has his Cougars ready for another run in the NCAA tournament. In 33 seasons as head coach, Sampson has established himself as a program builder who wins at every level. He has been named National Coach of the Year six times and is a leading candidate to win this year's award. He has won more than 700 games in his career and is one of only 16 coaches in NCAA history to lead multiple schools to the Final Four. In nine seasons at Houston, Sampson has led the Cougars to five NCAA tournaments and six conference titles. Prior to joining Houston, he spent six seasons as an assistant coach in the NBA for the Houston Rockets and the Milwaukee Bucks. He was previously the head coach at Indiana, Oklahoma, Washington State, and Montana Tech. In our conversation today, we talk about building a strong culture, coaching your team to manage pressure, and sustaining success. Here we go. This is my conversation with Coach Kelvin Sampson. You were a member of the Lumbee tribe in North Carolina. How did that shape you, how you grew up in the South? Get me inside of that. The town was Pembroke, and the uh, county was called Robinson County, and it was a uh, triracial county, uh, uh, whites, blacks, and Indians. Um, I didn't realize uh, the racial component until I got in my, um, about 11, 12, 13 years old. Uh, my father was a high school basketball coach, but back then high school coaches only had nine month contracts. So his first paycheck was in September and his last one was in May. So June, July, and August, you know, he had four kids, uh, all about the same age. So he had to go to work. So he had four jobs. He taught driver's education. He sold Lincoln life insurance uh he worked at a uh, uh tobacco market and he uh, sold world world book encyclopedias but it was the tobacco market that i think um, uh, changed me uh because my first time working there and this would have been in the mid 60s uh 65 to 67 68 somewhere in there uh that's that's when i noticed there's a racial divide uh, where i lived minorities relate to each other that's why I relate to, as I was growing up, I related to people that looked like me. So my first time there, I was working in the tobacco market. And there was different jobs you have to do because it's a sale. They sell tobacco. And these different companies buy it. And our job was to, to uh, tie it up, which was in these sheets, put it on uh, jacks, which are rollers. And would think of a square wood with uh, wheels on each corner. And we'd send it to the trucks and they'd take it to the uh, processing plants. Well, in the bathrooms at these tobacco markets, there was three bathrooms. It said white, colored, and other. And then there was three water fountains that said white, colored, and others. I remember my dad, who was my hero, uh, being called boy. Because all the, the buyers, all the powers that be in the tobacco market were all white. Uh, now, understand, this is before Charlie Scott became the first black player at the University of North Carolina for Dean Smith. So segregation was still heavily in place. Uh, my dad coached in what they called an Indian conference. So the only schools in that league were Indian schools. When he left there, he uh, started Magnolia High School. And then he went to Pembroke High School. And then he got into a different conference. And that was the first time that um, I'd seen somebody play basketball uh, that wasn't Indian. I saw black kids and I saw white kids. Growing up, as I got older, I, I started realizing 
You know, where, where is our place in the world? I always related to my black friends. And so I grew up, most people thought I was black because I related to black people because they looked most like me. And then when I got to college, uh, my best friends on the team, uh, Randy Bridges, Linwood Graham, uh, th those guys were my best friends. Um, so it influenced me in that it put a chip on my shoulder uh, because I was from a really small uh, community in that part of the county, uh, we got crapped on. Uh, racism was really heavy uh, in that area. You know, the Lumbee tribe is uh, uh, looks different than, say, the Cherokee or the uh, Chippewa Cree or, or uh, the Apache, the Comanche, or, or the Navajos. Most people thought we were mixed uh, in different ways, whether it's black and Indian, Indian and white. So you're always operating operating from that kind of uh, spectrum. But in, in that part of the county, they kind of made sure you knew where your place was. And that really did put a chip on my shoulder. Um, I, I kept that chip all through college. And then where it really came out was when I went to grad school at Michigan State University. One of the first classes that I attended was a, um, um, I think it was a med school class because I was getting my master's at the time in exercise physiology. And the instructor uh, asked everybody in the class to stand up, introduce yourself, say where you're from. So guys were standing up, uh, Notre Dame, Boston College, Michigan, Michigan State, and all the schools around that area, Wisconsin. Then I stand up and I say Pembroke State University. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, for me, uh, being in that environment, I, I think that's where I realized how competitive I was because uh, I, I wanted to get an A. I wanted to get an A in that class. I was from little old Pembroke State. These dudes from Notre Dame, Boston College, what did they got over me? I had already been put in a position where we weren't quite good enough. You know, we weren't quite good enough to be federally recognized. We were recognized by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but not by the federal government. Thus, we didn't get any funds for medical services, housing, education. Uh, we were on our own um, because we weren't, we weren't real uh, Indians. So um, grow, growing up there, that's kind of the crux of uh, the chip on my shoulder as people telling us who we were, who we were not, um, and then having to live under that shadow. Yeah, and you say, I love it, never lose your chip. And, you know, I know you had the opportunity to work under Judd Heathcote at Michigan State. Um, you know, it's a special place in my heart for sure, too. How, how do you maintain that chip on your shoulder once you've reached such a tremendous level of success like you're having, obviously, this season and ha have had throughout your coaching career? I'm an easy person to inspire. People draw inspiration from different, um, different people. You know, uh, I may inspire someone, but that same person may inspire me too. You know, uh, I, I read a book, still, it's still my favorite book of all time, was a book about Thurgood Marshall. And it went all the way back to how he, he was the, uh, the attorney that represented Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954, the most important segregation case in our history. Then he went on to become a Supreme Court justice. Uh, he also founded NAACP. The more I read about Thurgood Marshall, the more I wanted to be an attorney because I wanted to represent the oppressed. I wanted to help people because he inspired, he inspired me. But Thurgood Marshall had a chip on his shoulder. He did not like the fact that his people was disproportionately segregated against. Uh, they weren't treated right. and He wanted to make it right. So he was an inspiration um, uh, for me. Uh, he had a chip on his shoulder. He wore it every day. You know, when I started coaching at Montana, uh, when I started at Michigan State, Jed told me three times no, two times no. The third time he felt sorry for me and let me help with the JV team. And then when I went out to Montana uh, with a great guy by the name of Fred Paulson, who was the uh, third assistant, I went out in August and by December I was the head coach. I was the interim head coach. I was 25 years old. Montana Tech was by far the toughest, worst job in that league, not because of 
of uh, athletics because of academics. It was one of the best engineering colleges in America. Every degree curriculum required a minimum 30 credits of math. I was the sixth coach in three years, but that was the only job I could get. I had applied for jobs, but I was had no experience. So I, I took that job. And um, again, it was a job you weren't supposed to win at, but that fit into my byline. And then I left Montana Tech and I went to Washington State, same thing, 10th best job in a 10-team league. Those jobs um, were good fits for me because I had already been in a situation uh, growing up where I was used to being in positions where we weren't, we weren't quite good enough. We were thought to be not quite good enough. So having that chip on my shoulder just grew and grew and grew. Um, and thank God I've never lost it. Yeah, it serves you well. I want to dig into Houston, right? I mean, unbelievable season. But you returned to Houston from the NBA. Why? Tell me why you wanted to get back into the college space after, you know, was a heck of an experience at the NBA level. I did not initially, uh, Molly. Um, for various reasons, I didn't want anything to do with college. My safe space was the NBA. Uh, th those people accepted me uh, unconditionally. Uh, Greg Popovich, uh, Scott Skiles, Kevin McHale, Daryl Morey. I mean, they believed in me. They, they saw value in me as a, uh, uh, as a coach and a human being. Um, the relationship I had with uh, Greg Popovich, I was out of a job, I think, for uh, 10 hours. Uh, when I got fired, uh, within 10 hours, I got a call from Greg Popovich and said, I won't he said, Kelvin, we know, we know you. We know who you are. We want you to come to San Antonio. We want to hire you, and we're going to let you pick your title. You can be whatever you want, consultant, observer, uh, whatever. Pop whisperer, you, you be whatever you want. Uh, I think R.C. <laughs> Buford called me the pop whisperer, and then I found out nobody whispers to pop. Pop marches to the beat of his own, own drummer. <laughs> yes. um, but I found solace in that I was growing. I didn't know how little I knew about certain parts of basketball. So all of a sudden, doors and windows, roofs and ceilings started opening up. And I was just like a, an intern learning. Uh, Scott Skiles is a basketball savant. That is a smart, smart guy. He taught me so much about uh, strategy, end of game strategy. Pop taught me the different ways to guard, pick and roll. Mark. Uh, Mike Budenhauser and, and uh, Brett Brown, assistants at San Antonio, taught me how, how to thoroughly do a scouting report. Scott taught me about secondary breaks and end-of-game situations, things that I was I, I knew, but not the depth that they did it. Spacing, why you space, how you relocate after spacing. Uh, Kevin, Kevin McHale uh, taught me the importance of relationships. Um, uh, how to treat players, uh, because he was such a great NBA player, he treated them like men, and he expected the same in return. So for six years, I, I was uh, doing a sabbatical that that changed my life. It, it made me um, uh, better in, in just about every phase. And you probably learned a ton about leadership. Absolutely. The guys that succeed don't don't try to be like anybody else. They, they figure out who they are. I, I don't know that you can be who you are until you know who you are and then be comfortable with that be the best body fletcher you can be you know it's, m most coaches fail and i found this out being in the nba most coaches fail because they're afraid of confrontation and most people are afraid to confront confront because they don't like getting out of their comfort zone they know confrontation may create more problems but i've always viewed confrontation is as um, keeping a brush fire from becoming a forest fire. Because if you wait till it becomes a forest fire, well, well then it's over. We've, we've lost everything. But if, but if you're comfortable enough in yourself that you're coming from the right place and you believe in what you're doing, um, then they'll accept that. And if they don't, you may have done the right thing anyway. No question. So uh, Houston, I mean, you come to Houston, total rebuild total rebuild. How did you create the culture that you wanted, right? After your six years in the NBA, your history in college basketball, all that, how did you ensure that you were building the culture that you wanted? And what did, what did that entail for you? 
My dad died February 18th, 2014. My uh, agent, uh, Brett Just, came to me and said, look, here's some schools that are calling me uh, that want to talk to you. Uh, now, two of them want to hire you. A couple want to talk to you. And I said, okay, which ones are they? I didn't really have an interest, but I would say, well, who are they? Two of them had everything in place. They had all the facilities. They had uh, one, uh, they'd gone on tough times, but they had everything in place. When I was in the NBA, my sole goal was to be a head coach in the NBA. That, that was going to be the ultimate for me. You know, I, if I became a head coach in the NBA, I felt like, okay, I've uh, closed the circle. I put a, a period at the end of uh, the sentence and that, um, um, I felt like that. I don't think vindication is the right word, but I think it would be completion uh, for me. Mm -hmm. When I talked to my dad, I talked to him. Well, I was, he, you know, he watched every game, college or pro. He would watch every game that I coached. And he, he was my sounding board. He was my common sense whisperer. I always knew he would tell me the right thing. Coaches know what to say to coaches. Other people mean well, but unless you've walked in those shoes, it's difficult. I talked to him on a Sunday night. I was actually head coach for the Rockets. Kevin's daughter uh, had passed away. She was doing those foreign exchange student things in Australia. She, con she contracted lupus and she passed away at 22 years old. Sad. Just, just sad. Traumatic. But while he was away, I was the interim head coach. And, and when you're the interim head coach in that situation, you know, you, you lose yourself in your job. And that just fueled my fire even more. I wanted to be a head coach in the NBA. So I was in Los Angeles. We we're getting ready to play the Lakers. It was on a Sunday night. I called Dad. We talked for a while. And I said, you know what, Dad? My, uh, Brett called, and uh, he said, there's some schools inquiring. But he said, I, I said, I just want to stay here and, you know, write out my career and be a head coach in the NBA and just stay in the NBA. You know, he was a depression baby. He was born in 1929. So saying I love you was hard for him. His way of bragging on me would say, he always called me fella. He said, fella, your team played good tonight. That's about as far as I've, I've ever heard him go. That, that was, the, if, I could, if I could get that out of him, that means we play really good. <laughs> exactly. But he said something, Molly, that was totally out of character for him. I'm not going to go into, because I get emotional when I think about it, because he died the next day. So that night as I was talking to him, he's, he's, he told me that about value. He started talking about how you create value for yourself. And one of the ways you create value for yourself is put yourself in the best position to succeed. And he was saying all that to mean that, that um, uh, college is where I had the most value, where I could make the biggest difference and, um, and do the best work. He said, I've watched you coach in college. I've watched you sit on the bench as an assistant in the NBA. You need to be a college coach because that's where that's who you are. And lo and behold, right around that time, I get a call from the University of Houston. And I was looking at their situation, and you go, oh my God. But you know what? You know what, Molly? I needed Houston. I know how bad it was. And the more I looked at it, I think the more upset I got at the administration. Uh, because they kept firing coaches and they didn't do anything to help them. Decrept outdated, terrible, terrible facilities. The fan apathy uh, uh, from the top down was bad. But I said, I've been at Montana Tech. I've been at Washington State. I'm built for this. So if the only thing that they lack is, is uh, facility, we, we, we'll find a way to get facilities, right? Apathy, that's how you, you win, you create excitement. My biggest uh, decision was jumping in with two feet. Then about that time, my son Kellen got fired. He was, a, he was an assistant coach at Appalachian State with Jeff Capel's uh, brother, Jason. Uh, that staff got let go. Uh, my daughter was in a position where she wasn't happy. She had a job doing, doing good, but wasn't happy. So my wife and I were here in Houston. I said, Karen, here's, what do you think about this? What if we take the Houston job? I'd already researched the nepotism rule. And I knew that uh, Coach Knight over at Texas Tech uh, had his son as an assistant coach. If I can hire Kellen and I can bring Lauren in, uh, I think we can transform that program if they will buy in. 
So I talked to Brett and I said, Brett, here's, here's what I want to do. Um, so we came up with an alternative contract that include facility improvements and timelines on those improvements that was going to be tied to my buyout. So I knew that they were going to want me to sign an exorbitant buyout. And I was going to be willing to sign it as long as they agreed to do these facilities. And the, uh, uh, the agreement was when the facilities were not done by a certain date, uh, then my buyout lowered. If they built the facilities, the buyout was going to stay the same. If they did not, then it would go down because that told me they were not committed. My first athletic director was Mac Rhodes, uh, and I give Mac a lot of credit because he, he believed in the vision. He started it. We did a $25 billion Guy V. Lewis Development Center that was state-of-the-art. Now, the first, the first design came back at $15 million, and I said, don't do it. That's terrible. All you're doing is trying to get a C in the class. We need an A. You know, we need an A plus here. So we redid it, came back, did some design, uh, put this in, put this in, said, let's do it. Don't come back in five years and do it over. Let's do it right. So we got that done. Um, and that allowed us to recruit. Couldn't recruit any other way. Yeah, totally. Then Tillman Fertitta bought the Rockets, but he was also chairman of the board of uh, Regents here at the University of Houston. Right after I took the job, I went out to lunch with him. <clears throat> and Tillman's a busy man. You know, he he owns old Las Vegas. He owns all the casinos, Landry Sioux Food. He's got, he owns like a hundred different things. Brilliant, brilliant guy. So I go out to lunch with him with one of his uh, restaurants downtown Houston. And I'm sitting there talking to him. He's, he's, he's on his cell phone. Uh, he's taking calls. He's looking at the stock market. He's talking to this guy. And I'm having lunch with him. Well, full disclosure, I was getting pissed off. <laughs> I could tell this meeting was not important to him, but it was important to me. Mm -hmm. And sure. I looked at him. I said, Tillman, the only sport you can win a national championship here is men's basketball. You can't win one in football because the rules are stacked against you. You've got to be a power five school. But I said, you can't in basketball. So he stopped what he was doing and looked at me and said, you think you can win? I said, I know you can, but you, you've got to invest in these areas. The facility wasn't built yet, but we were moving toward that. But I said, the biggest thing is, what are we going to do with old Hoffines Pavilion? He said, do you think we need to build, uh, build a new one? I said, no. Because I knew a new one would take 10 years. Right. By the time you go through all the bureaucracy and fundraising and all that, I'd be long gone uh, when you built that thing. I said, we need ASAP, like yesterday, two weeks ago, to start a plan to renovate high fines. And the only way we can do that is to invest. I, I, I need you to believe in my vision, uh, Tillman. Well, long story short, Molly, he wrote a check for $20 million to put his name on the future Petita Center. And it's a state-of-the-art, beautiful facility. We sell it out every night. We've got a waiting list uh, for three years to get uh, a ticket into that building. Uh, we're going to be moving into the Big 12 next year. Having a vision, being inspired, getting people to buy into your vision, get inspiring them. But it takes a village. Having people that, that believe in you, that believe in your vision, uh, that, that's how we got this thing going in Houston. But the fact that it was in such bad shape was actually a positive for me because I needed to build something. And Houston needed someone that, that could come in and, and knew how to get the thing started. And we've been a great marriage. I mean, I, this, this is the best job I've ever had uh, because of what we've accomplished, number one, but more importantly, because of Kellen and Lauren. Do you find yourself feeling like you don't have enough time? Like you're drained and burned out? If so, head over to mollyfletcher.com backslash webinar to access this free training and get my game-changing energy management framework. That's mollyfletcher.com backslash webinar. Start today and learn to have more energy for what matters most. You build such strong relationships with your guys, with your players, but you coach them hard. You coach them hard. What's your philosophy there? How do you do that? What's your strategy? What do you do to, in order to love them, but hold them accountable and coach them hard? The guys I looked up to most in coaching was my dad, uh, Judd Heathcote, 
in the era I grew up was uh, Dean Smith, uh, Bobby Knight. Um, th- those guys were were the guys I looked up to. But the guys I related to the most was John Thompson, Nolan Richardson, John Cheney. Uh, I was a member of the Black Coaches Association. John Thompson reminded me so much of Thurgood Marshall because of his brilliance, his intelligence, his courage, his conviction, and his beliefs, and, and being able to inspire. Uh, he grabbed me at a Final Four uh, one year and sat me down and gave me unbelievable advice on the contract. He said, young man, you're going to be moving up in this profession. Let me tell you something about your contract. Make sure these three things are in there. Um, and I've tried to pass that on to, to uh, other uh, young black assistants uh, because of the impact that John Thompson had on me. Nolan Richardson's story, uh, how he grew up in El Paso, Texas, and been the only black uh, uh, coach and only black player black man just about wherever he went, winning an, uh, a national junior college championship, winning an NIT championship at Tulsa uh, with Mike Anderson uh, as his protege, John Cheney uh, from uh, Cheney State, and then to Temple what he did. I related to those guys. Those other guys impacted me, influenced me, but these John Thompson, uh, John Cheney, and Nolan Richardson, um, I could relate to them. I related to their story. They told me through their actions and the way they coached their teams that I could do it my way because I was more like them than the other guys. And then as I got to know uh, Coach Thompson and Nolan and, and John Chaney, it's even more inspiring because the impact they had on so many people. They, they impacted lives. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to help other people. Uh, Nolan Richardson used to have a golf tournament in Northwest Arkansas where he would invite I'd say 25 to 50 coaches in to help him fund, do a fundraiser there. And every year at the fundraiser, I mean, he had Charlie Pride, John Daly. He had all these celebrities there uh, for this dinner where he raised uh, about $500,000 for charities in Northwest Arkansas. He would always pray. He'd always do the opening prayer before the meal. And he said the same thing about every year. I went for four or five to different times, but he always talked about that uh, when it's your time to go to heaven, when you die, and it's time you get the pearly gates, and God asks you why you deserve to be there, he said, make sure it's because of what you did for other people. Uh, and that's how legacies are built, not by what you've, what you've done, but how you've helped others. And, and Nolan impacted me with that prayer. That, that, that's something that I haven't forgotten and something I've tried to pay forward uh, all these years. And that, I would imagine, is threaded through your approach each and every practice, each and every game, relevant to pouring into the guys and getting the best version of them out, both as young men, student athletes, and and, and basketball players. I get asked a lot about, what do you guys do for team building? I didn't know I was team building when I first started doing it. For instance, the night before every home game since 1988, our team comes to our house. This is where we have film, our film study. You know, uh, they, they were, were away from the gym. My wife, uh, Karen, bakes chocolate chip cookies that's legendary with our players through all the years. The way it started was, was um, we were doing scouting report up at the gym at Washington State, and Kellen and Lauren didn't like me not reading their bedtime story to them, the Bernstein Bears or whatever, or whatever it was back then. Um, and so... I'd say, Karen, why don't we just have the team over here and then I can read the bedtime story to them and we can still do scout report, kill two birds in one stone, then I don't have to miss. I would make the, the bedtime story fun. Karen would always get on me about getting them excited before <laughs> bedtime. Um, but I'd act out stuff, you know, like a da- like Dan's sure. do. <laughs> yeah. And then having the team there. But, um, you know, John Thompson would always say, uh, you're not allowed to MF them until they know you love them. And that's true. During the recruiting process, I'm heavily involved with recruiting every kid. I build a relationship with him. And then when he gets on campus, I don't just go full board crazy mode on him right away. I, I kind of lead up and <laughs> I lead up into it. <laughs> um, but that's because I want them to know that I do love them. And it's unconditional. 
I also tell them, don't confuse criticism with coaching. Coaching is teaching, but nothing's ever been taught until it's been learned. And nothing's ever been learned until it's been taught. This is the way I teach. Don't confuse that with criticism. When I get on you, uh, listen to it, and then let's move on. Now, it's important that you move on because I have. You know, don't let it linger. Uh, so we talk about uh, things like that. And uh, the fact that my son is our associate head coach, and then two of my uh, players at Oklahoma, one of the best players I've ever coached is Hollis Price. One of the best point guards I've ever had is Qantas White. They were the backcourt for that University of Oklahoma Final Four and then the next year Elite Eight team. They're, they're my guys. Uh, Casey Beard, who I work with with the Canadian Senior National Team. My top staff here is either my son, my former players, or a colleague. So everybody's part of our family. And our, and our players feed off that. They see how the coaches interact. They see the closeness of our coaching staff and, and the investment that we've made in them and that's how this whole thing works. How do you get your guys to play for each other, not with each other? One of the keys is treating them all the same. I'll give an example. Yesterday was uh, Tuesday. Monday was a day off because of the uh, 20-hour rule. So we had to take Monday off. So Tuesday, my best player, uh, probably going to be in the NBA next year. And I have another kid that's probably got a good chance of being a lottery pick. Uh, and then our leading scorer in the East Carolina game, three of our best players had had opportunities to get on the floor after a loose ball at East Carolina. Uh, now, we were up 20 at the time when each of them had this opportunity, but none of them got on the floor after a loose ball. So when we came to practice Wednesday, first thing I did was address that, and then I ran the crap out of all three of them before practice started. Now... Everybody understands that we're all the same here. And you can't have hierarchies in your program and think they're all going to play for each other. Uh, I treat everybody the same. Uh, if a manager's not doing his job, he's held accountable. Assistant coaches aren't doing their jobs, they're held accountable. Uh, the players, I don't care if you're a walk-on or the best player. Everybody is the same. And we've been doing that forever. And that's why uh, uh, when people say, how do you get your kids to play so hard? Because they don't want to, they don't want to let each other down. Because they know we're all in this bunker together. You know, I give our kids a bunker test every year, Molly. I put them both in a bunker. They're in a war zone. They're receiving incoming uh, fire, and they're running out, of, running out of ammunition. So one of them's got to leave and go get ammunition, right? Okay. Who on your team do you trust that will come back? Mm. And so we're we're constantly talking about things like that. You know, like during the game, during the game over the years, I've heard somebody say, come on, man, I'm getting shot at here. I need, I, I'm out of bullets. I need, I need you with me. You know, um, you know, when you have, when you have kids that will go get the ammunition, now once they go get the ammunition, they could leave and be safe. They don't have to worry about it. They don't have to ever get shot at again, but they come back. They come back into that war zone. They sit there, they, they get back in that bunker with their, teammate and do that together. So we're constantly talking about things like that. And then the way practices are, they, they all go through it. Those are tough practices, our conditioning, our weights. Everybody does it. Nobody gets out of anything here. So that's, that's one of the uh, keys to our secret sauce. What's harder, Calvin, building a winning culture or sustaining it? No question sustaining it because you're always going to lose players. The last five years, We've lost four starters every year for five years. My, we went to the Elite Eight last year. My, I had four seniors, Kyler Edwards, Fabian White, Josh Carlton, and Taj Gray. They all left. So now here we come back this year. Um, and the only reason why it works here is the remaining players have such a, um, a conviction and a belief in our culture that when new players come in, our players hold them accountable for how to do things. Like if a kid's not going full speed in our conditioning work in June and July, I don't have to worry about it. The, the, the players will tell them, hey, man, that's not the way it's done here. You know, uh, we touch every line in a line drill. And touching every line is, <laughs> is kind of symbolic for what, what we do. We, we touch every line. It's like going after every rebound. 
or sit down in your stance until the shot clock goes off, not, not quitting on a play. Uh, when the players believe in that, that's when, that's, that's when the best leadership comes out, when you have a player-led program versus a coach-led program. Uh, I'm, pr- I'm proud of the fact that our players take pride in, in their play. Um, and, and when you have, when you have sust- sustained success year after year after year, uh, the coach will get a lot of credit for that. But really, it's the players. The players that are coming back every year that means that we're not watering the flowers here, Molly. We're watering the roots. Mm-hmm. You know, culture is not flowers. That's not the pretty. It's not the pretty stuff. You know, it's like my two favorite uh, uh, time things I love watching this time of year is azaleas bloom and dogwoods. Uh, my mother loved white dogwoods, but everybody looks at the beauty of that tree. But the strength of that tree is those roots that nobody sees, and that's what culture is. Yeah. I love it. And you've done it. I mean, 17 NCAA tournaments, two Final Fours. You've won more than 700 games. You know how to build it, but you know how to sustain it. Know how to recruit good players. Yeah. <laughs> Calvin, March Madness, it's it's here. And your team is one of the favorites to win all of it. How do you coach your team to manage the pressure and the expectations so that they can maintain the level of focus they need to go to go all the way? I think we've averaged 28 or 29 wins a year for about five years, uh, something like that. Uh, and I think the key for us in doing what we do, uh, Molly, is focusing on what's in front of us and not worrying about what's ahead of us. We focus on the things that we need to get better at. Uh, now, I can't control the outside narrative. Uh, so, social media is probably one of the, the, the biggest scene terrors that will con- create seams in your team if you allow it. Um, but uh, our coaches are so focused on today's practice. <clears throat> we just had a coaches meeting and we went through three things we've got to be good at to win the game tomorrow night. Uh, so whatever our next game is, is really what our focus is. I never talk to them about anything that's out there in front of us. You know, be where your feet are, man. Where are your feet? Okay, today. But if you get your work done during the year, it puts you in the best position to be good um, at the end. And so um, our investment in each other and our investment in our team um, allow, allows us to, to be in a position to win the next game. Now, we all know that once you get in the tournament, you can lose because the bad teams aren't there. The only the good teams are there. So if those teams are in the tournament, you play any of them, they're, they're good enough to, uh, to beat you. And that's why you have to go back to your roots, which is our culture. Just play to your culture. Is there anything you wish you knew earlier in your career as a coach? One of the things that I, I wish I had been was more secure and not so insecure. Um, I think the way I grew up uh, created some insecurity uh, with me. Um, because I grew up in an area where we weren't good enough, you know, because of the color of our skin and the way our, the way we were treated. Uh, I, I, I knew that, and I knew what the narrative was about our people in that part of uh, the county in North Carolina. And I think I sought approval too much. I, I think I um, worried about that, worried about what people thought about me, um, wanted people to say good things or see good things. And uh, and as I got older and I uh, experienced failure with success, uh, you get to the point where you realize, and I think this is the most liberating feeling in the world, Molly, is when you get to the point in your life where you don't care what other people think or say. That is so liberating. You know, there's some faction that will say that should matter. It shouldn't matter to the point where it influences how you feel about yourself. You should be secure in yourself. I, I wish I had known that. I wish I had been there earlier. Um, now I've been like that for a, a while now, but I wasn't like that when I was in my 20s and 30s. Uh, there was a large part of me that didn't think I was quite good enough. You know, I was coaching against Lou Olson at Arizona and UCLA and Stanford and uh, College of Great Falls at Montana Tech was the preeminent team when I took that job. Um, you know, I, I just looked at those people as being better. 
Um, but that also made me work harder. I knew that for us to catch them, we had to, if they were working 10 hours, then we had to work 20 because we didn't have what they had. And that's what, that's why coaching at Montana Tech and Washington State was such a blessing for me because I was a great fit for them. I needed them. And then as we went along, uh, they needed, they needed someone that could handle uh, being at a place where you had to take 50 cent, make it $5. And I was comfortable doing that. Was there a tipping point when you felt that sense of peace at some level that I'm done worrying about what anybody else, was there a tipping point? Was there a moment when you woke up and went, wow, this feels like a little better way to show up and live? I think the more success you have, the more you're going to get criticized. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, You're going to get criticized more than you're going to be praised. Um, And I think the more I got criticized, whether, you know, my offense sucked, uh, I didn't know how to do this, I didn't know how to do that. You know, I heard it all. Then, you know, the life experiences that I've uh, I've had, um, I think the tipping point was being in the NBA and uh, coming to the realization that um, if you can operate from the fact that uh, as you get older, you get closer to retirement. And as you get close to retirement, you get, you get closer um, to understanding that the one thing we all have in common is we're all going to die. So when you're not a head coach, you can reflect more. I had time to think about a lot of things. And I realized that um, um, my way of doing things was the right way. The other thing I learned is you can never allow other people to define who you are or worry about what other people say or think because those people have no idea who you are. They're basing their decisions on what someone else said. And what someone else said may not even be true, but they believe it because it was said. Having enough strength to believe in yourself and being liberated enough not to worry about what other people say or think. I give that advice a lot to, uh, I do Zoom calls with uh, coaches, coaching staffs, uh, different groups. Uh, and I try to pass that message on. And that's hard to do when you're younger because you're, you're seeking approval. You, you, you need someone to recognize that you're doing good so you can move on. But that's something that I wish I, could, I had known and been better at as, as I was younger. But I'm, I'm thankful and I'm blessed that I know it now. Amen. What do you want your legacy to be, Coach? And then we'll hit rapid fire and get you out of here. Only that I, I did the best I could to help as many people as I can. I called one of my former players that was here. My, my first year here, we went 13 and 19. And then um, my first recruiting class, I had a big kid named Kyle Meyer. He was from a junior college in Florida. Uh, I saw him the other, uh, our last home game, we had a lot of former players come back. Uh, and I saw him there and I didn't get a chance to speak to him because I just saw him after the game. So I called him and just asked him how he was doing, asked him about his wife, his children, his job, his parents, all that, all that stuff. And um, I know that made him feel good, but I wanted, I wanted him to know that made me feel good too. Um, that that making other people feel good, that they feel special. Uh, because I'm I'm past the point where I need someone to help me do that. So now I want my legacy to be that uh, uh, I helped as many people feel good about themselves as I as I could. I love it. All right, Kelvin, I'm going to hit you with some quick ones and just tell me, uh, just fire back. What's your most memorable career moment to date? Beating Oregon State to go to the Final Four and having a group hug with my son and daughter. Oh, where was Karen? It's during COVID. They wouldn't let her down from the uh, okay. seats at Lucas Oil Stadium in uh, Indianapolis. <laughs> okay. What's something people often get wrong about you? My greatest joy is playing with my grandkids. I had this, you know, the intensity and uh, that I display during games and um you know, how I coach my kids, that I've got to be this, he must be a mean, hard drill sergeant, when really I'm just a, a teddy bear. And if they knew the relationship I had with my kids uh, off the court, uh, they, they would, if they knew that, they would think the other one's probably a facade because he's not really like that. Well, and I've been fortunate to see that, that side of you, that softer side, for sure. What, what's the best piece of leadership advice you've ever received? The difference between leadership and servant leadership. 
You know, I've always been a leader. And baseball, I was the catcher. Football, I was the quarterback. Basketball, I was the point guard. I always had some kind of, I grew up with leadership positions uh, in school, uh, what, whatever. But uh, I didn't really understand servant uh, leadership until I got to University of Oklahoma and started working with Joe Castiglione. Um, being exposed to different people in different situations, uh, you, you learn that everything is a learning experience. And I'm, and I'm thankful to this day, I still learn. I, I, I learn from everybody. Uh, and I've stolen so many ideas from so many different people that's helped me along the way. But um, servant leadership, serving others, um, making sure that the players that you're, that you're coaching understand that you're serving them. They don't work for you, they work with you. We're doing this together. I think that's the best form of leadership. I love it. So the show is called Game Changers. Who's a game changer who inspires you and why? My mother was a huge inspiration. She came from a really, really poor family, uh, farmers, tenant farmers in North Carolina. She was still going to school to get her RN degree when I was uh, uh, 13, 14 years old. I can remember her staying up at night, uh, smoking cigarettes and drinking black coffee, um, knowing that she had to get up at six o'clock uh, to get her kids ready for school and to go to work. And my, my grandfather had a little, this was before the chain grocery stores. There wasn't any Kroger's or Safeways or Piggly Wigglies or Winn-Dixie's, none of that. Um, my grandfather had the, the, the only grocery store in our community. He didn't even have a cash register. It was a wooden drawer with scoops in it for the coins and a long thing for the dollar bills. And I worked there uh, after school on Fridays and on Saturdays, and he paid me $2. Every Saturday, he'd give me $2. And I would take those, um, those $2 and I'd give them to my mother because I, I felt like she, she, needed, she needed the money to help her to go to school, but she inspired me uh, to do that. And I look back, uh, my, my dad was my hero, but my inspiration was my mother. Wow, I love how you break that down. Calvin, it's so good to see you. Give Karen and the, uh, good to see you, Molly. the kids who aren't kids anymore a big hug for me. No, I will, Molly. Thanks for having me on, girl. All the best. a few of my favorite takeaways from my conversation with Calvin. As you could have probably discerned from my conversation with Calvin, I represented Calvin for years and it was fun to, to sit down in this platform with him and share this conversation with you. Here are a couple of my favorite takeaways from my conversation with Coach. Number one, your roots are your culture. As Calvin said, water the roots, not the flowers. Everyone sees the beauty of the flowers, but the strength is in the roots. Your roots are the culture you create. Invest in it. Water it. And then you'll see the results. Number two, a player-led team is better than a coach-led team. I hear this so often from great coaches. This one is a great reminder for all of us as leaders. Accountability can't just come from the top down. The real magic happens when team members take pride in their work and they hold one another accountable. And number three, don't run from hard. Oh, this is so good. I love the life lessons that Kelvin got from his dad. Go where you can create value for yourself. It's about where you can make your biggest difference and do your best. That's not always the easy option. Great stuff. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.